Amen. Amen. All right. So as we come, we want to join with the angels this morning. The four and twenty elders who in the throne room of God constantly say, Holy, 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 holy. Revering the Lord as the high and holy one. We are going to sing, You are holy. Oh, so holy. What a privilege and honor to worship at your throne, to be called into your presence as your own. Sing along with us.
Amen. You are holy. Jesus, 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 what a wonder you are. That's why we worship you. We call you holy. We call you the Rose of Sharon. We call you the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus, 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 what a wonder you are. Everybody and hear everybody singing this one. Everybody, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. to remain on your feet, standing on your feet just a little while longer as we open God's Word. 1 Samuel chapter 12. Praise team, you can take your seat. 
Y'all ought to clap them as they go down to their seat. They really led us to the throne of God today. Praise God. 1 Samuel chapter 12. I'll read in the New Living Translation. I'm going to read the entire chapter. Then Samuel addressed all Israel. I have done as you asked and given you a king. Your king is now your leader. I stand here before you, an old gray-haired man, and my sons serve you. I have served as your leader from the time I was a boy to this very day. Now testify against me in the presence of the Lord and before his anointed one. Whose ox or donkey have I stolen? Have I ever cheated any of you? Have I ever oppressed you? Have I ever taken a bribe and perverted justice? Tell me and I will make right whatever I have done wrong. No, they replied. You have never cheated or oppressed us. You have never taken even a single bribe. The Lord and his anointed one are my witness today, Samuel declared, that my hands are clean. Yes, he is a witness, they replied. It was the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron, Samuel continued. You brought your, who brought, he brought your ancestors out of the land of Egypt. Now stand here quietly before the Lord as I remind you of all the great things the Lord has done for you and your ancestors. When the Israelites were in Egypt and cried out to the Lord, he sent Moses and Aaron to rescue them from Egypt and to bring them into the land. But the people soon forgot about the Lord their God. So he handed them over to Sisera, the commander of Hazor's army, and also to the Philistines and to the king of Moab, who fought against them. Then they cried to the Lord again and confessed, We have sinned by turning away from the Lord and worshiping the images of Baal and Ashtoreth. But we will worship you and you alone if you will rescue us from our enemies. The Lord sent Gideon, Badan, Jephthah, and Samuel to save you, and you lived in safety. But when you were afraid of Nahash, the king of Ammon, you came to me and said that you wanted a king to reign over you, even though the Lord your God was already your king. All, all right, here is the king you have chosen. You asked for him, and the Lord has granted your request. Now, if you fear and worship the Lord and listen to his voice, and if you do not rebel against the Lord's commands, then both you and your king will show that you recognize the Lord as your God. But if you rebel against the Lord's commands and refuse to listen to him, then his hand will be as heavy upon you as it was upon your ancestors. Now stand here and see the great thing the Lord is about to do you know that it does not rain at this time, and if the year during the wheat har of this time of the year during the wheat harvest, I will ask the Lord to send thunder and rain today. Then you will realize how wicked you have been in asking the Lord for a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people were terrified of the Lord and of Samuel. Pray to the Lord your God for us, or we will die, they all said to Samuel. For now we have added to our sins by asking for a king. Don't be afraid, Samuel reassured them. You have certainly done wrong, but make sure now that you worship the Lord with all your heart and don't turn your back on him. Don't go back to worshiping worthless idols that cannot help or rescue you. They are totally useless. The Lord will not abandon his people because that would dishonor his great name. 
for it has pleased the Lord to make you his very own people. As for me, I will certainly not sin against the Lord by ending my prayers for you, and I will continue to teach you what is good and right. But be sure to fear the Lord and faithfully serve him. Think of all the wonderful things he has done for you. But if you continue to sin, you and your king will be swept away. A farewell address. Joshua gave a farewell address. And farewell addresses were commonplace. When someone was about to go off the scene, they would give a farewell address. And then they would die. But the chapters go on after 1 Samuel chapter 12. And it talks about Samuel still being active as priest over Israel. And they're moving on. So Samuel's farewell address was not about his death. Samuel was acquiescing to what God had given him permission to do. Israel had gotten to a place where they wanted a king. Jesus, help me to say these next words clearly and carefully. Israel was supposed to be a nation that was different. They were supposed to be a people that stood out amongst what was popular in society at the time. I need you to hear me right now because I, I, I don't want to hit on the usual markers when we start talking about this issue and we start talking about dress reform and we start talking about eating habits and we start talking about behavioral modification because the way God's people are peculiar is not just in what they put on the outside of them. It's something that's supposed to be on the inside that then appears on the outside. I need to be clear on this because too often we are trying to make people Adventist and, and acquiesce to Adventist culture when we should be making people disciples of Jesus because if Jesus gets down on the inside of you, he tends to change what happens on the outside of you. An adjustment and a change cannot take place in your life until God gets in you. But we want to rush folk into dress reform. We want to rush folk into eating habits. And I'm telling you right now, if you take out the grace and mercy of God to work on the life of transforming people and give them that time to adjust, you create premature Christians who become religious zealots. And religious zealots, hear me? Religious zealots never have disciples so here we go Israel was set up by God remember he chose them if you believe that say amen God chose them and they were supposed to be different well how were they supposed to be different pastor well let me just just inform your brain for a brief second Every single nation back then had a monarchy, a king that was set up to rule the people. Every single nation. But when God called Israel and brought them out of the land of Egypt, God set up something different than a monarchy. God set up what we know to be a theocracy. Theocracy means God called the shots, God made the decisions, God showed the signs, Israel obeyed. God was the one who sat on the throne of Israel. No one was to move him off of it. And if they but trusted and obeyed, then everything would have been all right with them. But you know what happens to a church that is around for a long time. As the generations flow through the church, they begin to forget their first love. 
They begin to look around at what's happening around them, and they begin to say, we need to be like this, and we need to be like that, and we need to talk like this, and we need to pray like that, and we need this type of pastor, and we need this type of eldership, and we forget that God calls the shots. We begin to politicize positions. We begin to talk about all types of things that have nothing to do with God because God doesn't set these things up and we create a headache for ourselves. Remember, the monarchy is a man-made construct. And anything man-made is tainted with sin. Somebody needs to listen to me right now. They looked around as the generations passed, and they saw that everybody else had a king. So they says to themselves, they says, we need a king too. And so there was this little grumbling that started amongst the people. Why don't we have a king? Look at all the other nations with their pomp and Look how regal their royalty looks. And look how the, the army is reflective of the power of the king. And we don't have that. We look like a ragtag bunch of misfits in a land that has kings all around us. We ain't got no king. We're just a, a bunch of tribes sitting out here in no man's land. We're exposed to the elements. And if anything happens, we don't have a king that can rally an army that can come to protect us. Oh, how we forget that God has been God to us in the past. Samuel started his farewell address by saying, you forget that it was God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You forget that when you were crossing over the Jordan River and you came into the promised land, it was God that got you past the Jericho Wall. You forget about all the Philistines as they attacked you from left and right. And every time, watch this, every time you raised up altars to other gods, all of a sudden foreign invaders came into your territory. Because you trusted in other gods. And you forgot that I am God all by myself. I don't need help with anything. Because see, every time Israel got in trouble... What was normal and what became the norm was that they would cry out to God and God would rescue them. In spite of their disobedience, God will still show up for them all the time. I, I wonder if anybody in this room can testify to the fact that every time you've been in serious trouble, God has shown up. I just wonder if I have a church this morning that can say that God has been God for them. And there were times that it looked impossible and bleak, but God shows up. But why did it get to be impossible and bleak? We got to break that down. There are only two reasons that things get difficult in your life. And you've got to be able to discern between the two. One is that you prayed and asked God to perfect your character. So, Sister Lamb, sometimes because we can't hear, there's only two ways you learn. You either hear or you. And if you can't listen to God when he's trying to perfect your character, he will teach you a lesson through experience. Mm. I see the church is kind of quiet this morning because we've been taken out to the woodshed a couple of times. We don't like that one. But, but, but what God will do, Sister Prim, is that if you're asking him to increase your faith, and remember that one of the prayers of the saints is, Lord, make me ready to go home with you. Lord, increase my faith. And so if you're asking God to increase your faith, and he knows that you won't listen by hearing, then he will let calamity come so that you can learn the lesson the hard way but how many of you know when you learn a lesson the hard way, you never forget it? And God will bring difficulty into your life so that you can learn the lesson that he needs you to learn. Because without that lesson, you ain't ready for heaven. So I thank 
God for even the trouble that comes into my life because through the trouble, God's making me ready to go home with him. If God never took away the job where you understood what poverty was and where you understood that you had to limit what you could buy, then you would not be ready to let go of your riches when he came back. So he took it away from you so you can get used to being poor. So when he comes again, you're ready to go because you can't stand being down here any longer. Oh. Well, the second way that he allows calamity to come into your life is because you have abandoned him. See, we, this is the part we don't like to talk about because here's the truth about Christians. We don't totally abandon God. We're okay with letting God be God over certain things in our lives. But we've got a real problem keeping him over everything in our lives. Why are you quiet? We, we don't want God to be over certain aspects of our Here's how we make the switch. And it's so subtle, Brother Errol. Here's how we make the switch. When God isn't moving fast enough in a particular area, when we've prayed and asked him to do something and he doesn't come through for us the way that we feel he should come through for us, then we are quick to say we need to raise up another king. We need to put somebody else in charge of this area of our lives. Oh, we're good with letting him be God when it comes to our finances. We're good with letting him be God when it comes to the church that we belong to. We're good with letting him be God when it comes to being the keeper of my home and the sustainer of my job. We're good. I can praise him all the live long day, but God, I prayed and I asked you for love in my life. And I'm 29 and my biological clock is ticking. And Lord, you're moving just a little too slow for my liking. I know I've bowed down before you and I've prayed, Lord, I'm ready for he to come into my life. I'm ready for the one that you have. My Boaz is on the horizon. I name him and claim him in Jesus' name. I, I don't know who I'm talking to today. But I know I'm talking to somebody. Uh, Lord, Lord. Or, or, or this may have been your petition. Lord, I, I was married. Unfortunately, my husband passed. Or we may have split up and gotten divorced. But I, I'm ready again for love in my life. I need you to show up. And you've been praying. And Errol, we pray that prayer. By faith, the Lord will answer. He will answer. I'm not going to say who I'm looking at. Let me do this when I make this next statement. Sometimes the prayer is, Lord, I didn't consult you when I married the first time. And this brute has become a real problem in my life. And I thank you, Lord, that you're removing him from my existence. But I'm lonely. I need you in my life to show up and bring somebody to me. Let me explain why God is God and not you. Because some of us erect another king. Ellen White writes that when we're ready for marriage, we ought to pray seven times more than how we prayed before. Because who you bring into your life to be a part of your life should be, should be appointed by God to be there. Remember that the, that the, the number one thing about God is that he desires that you be saved, not that you're married. He will let marriage come into your life, but only if that person has a desire to also see that you make it to heaven. 
And the, the, the responsibility, the primary responsibility of a spouse in your life is to help you get to glory. Not to make you happy. Your goldfish can make you happy. But, but some of us erect another king. And so we move ahead of God. And we get involved because we're ready to mix and mingle. We're just so lonely that we need. And I'm telling you, the devil will use your weaknesses to enter through your doors. I'm lonely, Lord, and to find somebody. And every week and every day, God cries out to you, don't abandon my plan for your life. But you decide to step ahead of God and you allow somebody to come into your life that has no desire for your salvation whatsoever. So they start to suggest things that sound good, but they're not godly. Let me be clear on when I make this next statement. Anybody that suggests something ungodly to you does not love you. And now you find yourself in a position where you're stuck involved with a person that you have no business being involved with because God never brought you that person. But you went ahead of God and decided to appoint yourself king. And you decided to start listening to your own advice. And now this person is in your life constantly asking you to push the boundaries of your faith further and further away from God. And you start finding yourself being compromised in your faith. It's time for us as people to get rid of certain kings in our lives. You ought not never bow your head to anything other than God who is the source of my strength and the strength of my life. Because listen, the choice is yours and you need to determine to let certain things go out of your life. Amen. Write down this next phrase. It is easier to mourn the loss of someone in your life than to continuously push back your boundaries to tolerate the disrespect they bring to you. There's some phone calls you shouldn't answer anymore. Some text messages you shouldn't respond to anymore. Some situations you should not find yourself in anymore. Because nobody forces you into it. You make the decision. And here's the beautiful thing. We love to blame the devil for things that we got ourselves into. And here's the joke. When you go playing on the devil's playground, he shows up. It's his playground. You decided to make the decision to step there, and then you turn around and say, well, the devil made me. The devil didn't make you do anything. You did it all to yourself. He just took advantage of your decision. And once you find yourself in it, he keeps bringing things your way so that you can't get out of it. Some of us just got to get to a point where we just cut some people off out of our lives. And be quite all right with that. Because here's what you begin to realize after a while. You begin to realize that you're missing something in your life. And the missing element of your life is the God that was there before. You decided to let him go. Listen to what Samuel tells the people. Samuel, Samuel said, God never intended for you to have a monarchy. Never intended it. 
God wanted you to be a peculiar people by having a theocracy. In other words, a God that led the way. But you're begging for a king. As a matter of fact, they were warned by God before they got a king. God said to them, if you have a king, he's going to give you taxes. How many of you love taxes? How many of you love paying taxes? Can I get anybody that loves pay taxes? No? No? You'd rather keep your money, wouldn't you? But God warned them. He said, if you have a king, if you erect a monarchy, you will be taxed. If you erect a monarchy, they're going to create a, a, a subscription where your children would have to join their armies. If you create a monarchy, they will lead your children into war and your children will die by the sword. If you erect a monarchy, they will take your daughters from your homes and make them part of their harem if you create a monarchy. If you create a monarchy, they will steal your cattle and your goats and all of your sheep. They will create for themselves wealth out of your own pocket. And I'm telling you now, if you create a monarchy, that will come your way. But if you keep me as king over your nation, I will never impose those things on you. And Israel said, give us a king. So this is Samuel's farewell address. Samuel says to them, have I ever done anything that would cause you to look at me and say, you're not worthy to lead us? And the people said, you've never done a thing. Have I stolen from any of you? Have I not served God according to his word? And the people said, you have. You've done everything perfectly. But you still choose to be a follow fashion monkey and to do what everybody else is doing around you. Because that was Israel's problem. They looked around them instead of keeping their eyes on Jesus. All this month long, we've been dealing with looking at Jesus in Wednesday night prayer meeting. And we have resurged within us this revival that if we just keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, all of the noise around us will fade into the background. And thank you that Jesus, that whenever you look at him, you forget certain things that you thought were problems because you realize that in Christ, you have all the sustenance you need. You ain't got to go nowhere else for any help. You just got to look to the hills from whence cometh your help and your help cometh from the Lord. It is God that you need to stay focused on. It is his will and his way that you need to stay focused on. Never you abandon God for what's popular. Amen. Because you'll find yourself living in a moment when you realize something is missing. Something's missing. Samuel says to them, and I'm coming to the end. Samuel says to them, God has given you what you wanted. You don't need to rejoice every time God gives you what you want. I was driving. I don't know how many of you remember this, but there was a car brand by the name of Eagle. Eagle. And I remember my grandmother, blessed memory, was driving an Eagle, a gray Eagle. And she gave me that car to go to school. I drove that car down to AUC. Christina, you remember the gray Eagle that I had. Drove it down to AUC, and I'll never forget, I got the car down there, eight-hour drive from Toronto down to AUC, got it down there, parked it up in the parking lot. I felt like I, felt like I was king of the roost. I was one of the few that had a vehicle. <laughs> I'll never forget when 
I got an oil leak, Brother Powell. Got an oil leak. <laughs> and I got vexed. This car shouldn't be giving me problems. But you got to be prepared for the responsibility that comes when you own a car. I got a friend of mine, an older friend of mine who came in. He helped me. We fixed the car. And the moment we got the oil leak fixed, Sister Michelle, we, we went. I drove the car. Then a pipe burst on it. And so now the coolant system was in jeopardy. So it cost me maybe about 100 bucks to buy the part to fix the oil. And Brother Hunt, it took me another maybe, at the time, maybe about $80 to buy the part to fix the coolant. But I'm vexed. I want a new car. God never gave me a new car. God gave me an old car and said, work with this until... I provide something else, but I kept pushing. I want a new car. My junior year of college, I preached a sermon in the college church. I don't even remember the sermon that I preached. I preached that sermon on the Sabbath. On the Monday morning, I got a call in my room, my dorm room at college. It was the president of the Southern New England Conference. And he said to me, I need you to come over to my office this afternoon. I said, okay, and the, office, the, the conference office is right beside where the school was. So I walked over there that afternoon. He looked me in the face and said, you will report to this church on Sabbath coming. You are now an employee of the Southern New England Conference. I was kind of shocked because I had not even yet graduated college. But they were appointing me to a church. Now, when I saw the appointment, one of the things that was revealed to me was how much they were going to be paying me in order to be the pastor of this church. The first thing that popped into my head I am now making enough that I can get a car. I already had one. But it kept giving problems. And now I can get a new one. Thank you, Jesus. Here was the problem. You ever tried to do something without consulting God first? That's how easy it is to make something else king. Because there should never be a decision made unless you first consulted God. B. Simone, who is a popular, popular person today because of the internet and because of a, a show called Wilding Out on MTV. She was really wilding out in her younger days. She turned 30 realized, Suzette, that something needed to change in her life. And God led her to him. And she became a child of God, got herself baptized. The moment she did that, she started losing popularity. But she had a platform, and she decided she was going to put herself on her platform. And when she did, she created a podcast. And I was listening to her podcast the other day, and she said this. She said, there was a time in my life when I would do things without consulting God. She says, I've reached a place in my life now where God has shown me enough that I will never make another decision in my life or over my life unless I talk to God first. She's not a Seventh-day Adventist. And I'm saying that because some of us believe that only Adventists can have those types of revelation. Listen to me. When God gets a grip over your life and you decide to turn yourself over to him, you understand who is king in your life. She made that statement. I'll never make another decision in my life unless I've consulted God first. How 
many of us have made decisions for a mortgage without consulting God first? How many of us have made decisions for a spouse without consulting God first? How many of us have made decisions on investments without consulting God first because the numbers looked good and because the person sounded good or because this person looked good or they were credible? Listen to me. The only thing you can trust in your life is God. So I decided once I got the job, I'm going to get rid of this car. And I didn't consult God before I did it. I just took it for granted. This was the Lord's sign showing me that I could get a new car. And I went out and I bought, uh, 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 it wasn't a brand new, but it was two years old at the time. I bought a 1995 Nissan Altima stick shift. Drove that thing off the lot. I felt so good about myself. Dale, I, I, was, I was shifting gears and I was speeding down the 95. Had the car for a month. Remember, when I had the Eagle, had an oil problem, cost me $100 to fix. Had a coolant problem, cost me $80 to fix. And I complained about that. As a matter of fact, with the Eagle, my insurance was low. The moment I got the Nissan, the insurance, the first problem was that I had to pay more money in insurance for the car. Here was the next problem. A month after I got the car, transmission blown. cost me well over a thousand dollars to fix. But I didn't complain because I had declared this was the Lord. I said, Lord, you're, you kind of have a funny way of showing your, your approval. While it was at the shop fixing the transmission. You ever took your car in for something simple and they come back to you with a whole bunch of stuff? <laughs> While I was in the car in the shop getting the transmission fixed, uh, mechanic comes to me and says, you need four new tires. <laughs> it's going to cost you, at the time, it's going to cost you $700 for four new tires. And I stood there and I realized I hadn't consulted God. And if I'd kept the old car, I would have looked peculiar. But I would have had more money in my pocket. And the Lord would have seen me through. You need to stop looking at what everybody else is doing. <laughs> And you need to make sure that God is king of your life. Because you will discover soon enough that if he has not been involved in all your decision making, that you'll be missing something in your life. I see some of you don't get it yet. So I'll end with this. I am from a place that has unique cuisine. Hmm. Uh, I would like to believe that I have an expanded palate. I can enjoy cuisines from other places. But every now and then, because of where I'm from and because of the delectable delights that often stream from the kitchens of those who are from where I'm from, every now and then you get a hankering for something that you know and is familiar to your taste buds. Things that you've developed over the years as likings because you just enjoy them so much 
And oftentimes, my mind would drift back to those days when we would do simple things, but they would taste so good. My country, there is a particular delicacy uh, that not everybody likes, but most people do. And every now and then, we find ourselves wanting to indulge in this delicacy. It is not something you can find on a tree. It is not something that grows in the ground. It is something that is um, um, created out of the hard work of a certain company known as Grace. And this company will create this product and put it on the shelves. And most of my people, and not all because I can't speak for all of them, but most of my people, Carleen, will walk and see the product on the shelf and say, thank you, Jesus. And the product is called corned beef. <laughs> now... I have spoken of it in the way that is proper to the English tongue. But my people call it something different. And if you know, you know, call it with me, bully beef. <laughs> Every now and then my, my mouth waters for I apologize to all the vegetarians and vegans in the room, but I've got to walk down this road today. So my wife, who is, not, who is not from where I'm from, cannot understand the reason why I have such a hankering sometimes for that delectable delight. Every time we walk past it on the shelf, I look at it longingly, as if an old flame that got away from me. But whenever she's not looking, I will pluck from the shelf that little tin. And it looks so wonderful. The packaging is so nicely wrapped around it. And I pick it up off the shelf and I put it in the, in the cart. And I will go home. And I'll put some white rice to steam. <laughs> on the stove and water begins to bubble and you put that how many of you know that you really want good steamed rice you put that tin foil over the pot and then put the lid and that thing steam for the hunt you're a chef you know what i'm talking about that rice is steaming and you know that that thing called bully beef when done right so I get my onion and I chop it up into little, little minuscule cubes. And I will get my green pepper and red pepper and dice it up and put it in. I get some green onion that we call skep. I see that you're with me. I get skelly and I cut that thing up and, you know, begin to prep. And then I get what we affectionately know to be a scotch bonnet pepper. But I, I try not to use the green one. I try not to use the orange one. I try not to use the red one. I go for the brown one. Because if you know, you know that the brown one is the most flavorful and packed with heat. And I love heat. And I'll cut that scotch bonnet pepper up, seeds and all. Put that junk inside the pot and I will saute the vegetables with a little garlic and just let it that the aromas waft up into the kitchen you know you 
We did it. Anna Reese, it's what we call sofrito. We just put it all together. We mix that thing up and ready. And my rice is steaming over here, and I got the vegetables going. And the only thing left to do is, and, and, and trust me, this is a very spiritual moment for me. I, the only thing left to do is to take the contents in the tin and put it inside the pan and mix it as it mixes with those seasonings. You know, come together so you, and you can, in your mind as you're cooking, you can taste it. And you pick that tin up and realize you can't use it because the key <laughs> is missing. You went through all of that preparation. But the one thing that's missing, that's why, that's why I got into the habit of walking around with a bully beef key in my keychain. So that could never happen. Listen, you've got to get in the habit of putting God in the middle of your life for every decision. Because if you don't, you'll find things all prepped and ready to go. But you can't get what you want because God ain't in it. If you want to be successful in life, put God in the middle of your life and stop bowing to other kings. Feel free to share that with anybody you want to. So my appeal is simple today. It's simple. He's the missing piece to your life. But pastor, I come to church every week. I, I study my Sabbath school lesson. But if you're honest, he hasn't been totally over your life. My appeal today is simple. Make Jesus the center of your life. You want that today? If you do, just stand to your feet where you are. When we walk with the Lord, in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. And while we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Somebody who needs Jesus. Somebody who needs Jesus to be completely over their life. Walk the aisle. Completely. Not halfway, not three quarters of the way, but all the way. Is there somebody in the room today? You need Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, step out. Don't feel shy. Come. 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 Come, 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 come. See, there's some things in our lives that have been working, but there's some parts of it that's not. If we're honest, certain parts just not. It ain't working because that's the part that's missing the input of God and sometimes we're afraid to get him to be the input in that area because we don't like where it's going to take us but if you do the Lord's will oh 
all hear me somebody today if you do the Lord's will according to his word God never fails on his promises if he says he will bless you he will bless you and sometimes the blessing is not giving you what you want but giving you what you need and he says I know I know other people look happy with what you want but trust me there's misery without me don't scream for another king when God has been doing the job well all along don't ask for anything else in your life because he's already been God all the time. Stand out from the rest of society and affirm to everybody that you know, God is the joy and the strength of my life. Be peculiar by being his child all the time. Not just sometimes. That's what peculiarity is. It's not in how you look. It's not just in what you sound like. It's the fact that you've decided to make Jesus your all. In every aspect of your life. So is there anybody else today? Is there anybody else today? The sky, but his smile quickly drives it away. everybody today. I'm going to ask that after we pray today. Uh, where's Elder Powell? Elder Powell, is he here? Did he walk outside? Elder Powell, Elder Morris, if you don't mind, after the prayer, can we just lead these folk out on the side to the, to the conference room as we pray for them some more over there? Because here's what I want to do. I, I know we've laughed and we've enjoyed ourselves today, but the truth is life is serious. It ain't a joke. And sometimes the things that you came in here with problems for are serious. You want God to give you a real answer for it. I'm here today as the Lord's mouthpiece just to advocate. Give God a try. Over every aspect of your life, just give God a try. Just give him a try. I promise you, he will come through for you. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Eternal Father, we've been in your presence today. We truly have enjoyed the meal that you've prepared. This word is sweet, Lord. We were reminded through an ancient story that you don't want to be second place in anybody's life. You want to be the only king in our lives. Give us, I pray, the strength and courage not to bow to anybody else. Give us, I pray, the power that we need in order to be yours and yours alone. 
help us not to become fearful of the shadow by day or the arrow by night help us to remain true to the God we love remind us that other gods and other kings have no power but you're the only God who can speak a word and things become just by the utterance from your voice thank you for reminding us today that we are yours and yours alone today as we continue to worship you in spirit and truth remind us all day that you care for us and you love us and you're always there for us i pray nobody in this room or watching online will ever remove you from your rightful place thank you for forgiving us when we have erred bless us to remember that you're god of our lives and lord take this congregation i pray and lead every soul to your bleeding side is our prayer in jesus name we all say amen amen and amen